we began with Bildad's speech last time, and uh, a lot of it was us talking about, well, how essentially Bildad was interacting with Job's speech and Job's situation. Um, we didn't quite get to everything within that particular section, I don't think. Yeah, no, we didn't. So we were discussing mainly like uh, how Bildad acted as a comforter and uh, how well he fulfilled that role, which I believe the ultimate consensus was, well, he was really bad at it. <laughs> mainly because he was dismissing Job's words and he was also calling out his kids as sinful human beings who deserve to die. So I really hope it doesn't need to be said, but don't tell a grieving parent that. <laughs> uh, yeah, your, jo your job as a comforter is not to call it as you see it, but, as, but just to try and help the person grieve. So what we'll do, uh, you're looking at the section verses two to seven last time. So let's read this again to refresh our memory and then we'll continue in our discussion of it. And uh, then I, I don't know how far we're going, to, we're going to get today because the next little section that Bill that has, it's going to be, we could talk about that for hours. So uh, let's concentrate <laughs> Verses two to seven at the moment. Would anybody like to read? Sure. Thank you. And Bildad the Shiite replied, how long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. God, does God pervert justice? Does the almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will look to God and plead with the almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your rightful place. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. Yeah, so we covered, I believe, verses two to four. So that was dismissing Job's words. Um, Bildad appealing to God as the proper source of justice, and then uh, kind of denouncing his children. So we're going to be going to the next little bit here, so verses 5 to 7, which is um, basically, uh, uh, if you will look to God and plead with the Almighty. So. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I guess we don't need to say too much about that, but uh, if you are pure and upright, even now, he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your proper place. So what condition is Bildad putting on your prayers? Like, why would God fulfill your prayers in the eyes of Bildad? Only if you without sin, and that kind of dismisses all of us. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And, you, and think gonna... Bill Dad, you think Bill Dad thought that he was himself without sin because he wasn't under obvious punishment, that he was righteous. Yeah, so he was righteous. I, th I think this is Bill Dad kind of making an appeal to the popular, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the popular Jewish understanding of what a minimum righteousness was. Um, when, when you find Jesus going about in the gospel reading uh, and he's talking to various individuals within the Jewish community, like even the Pharisees, uh, they had a conception of what was righteous and what wasn't righteous. Uh, or even with the rich young ruler who comes up to Jesus and says, what, to, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, you know the commandments, uh, honor your father and mother, do not steal, do not commit adultery, uh, do not 
and commit murder. And then the guy goes, yeah, I've, com I've fulfilled all of these since the day of my birth. So the idea was kind of um, fulfilling the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. Where, yeah, I, I haven't murdered anybody, so I must be all good, right? Right. But yeah, it, when you look at the intent of the law, which is the protection of somebody's life, even their life in relation to you in, in a very spiritual or emotional or psychological sense, uh, if you are committing an act of hatred against your neighbor, that is murdering them in your heart. And, and this is what Jesus is getting at in Matthew chapter 5 when, with the Sermon on the Mount where he's saying, uh, don't call your brother Raka or because that is that is violating the fifth commandment, the do not murder. So the Jews kind of felt that they were actually completing the covenant law, where whereas Jesus came and rocked their world by saying, No, you have not fulfilled the law. You've all failed the law. And much of what Jesus was actually saying was an intensification of the law. So if you think you, if, if you're righteous under the law, then think again, because there's still more law for you to do. And I think that's more where Bildad is getting at, where it's, there is a certain level of righteousness a human being can have under the law. Um, but yeah, our, our inclination, especially as Lutherans who are looking at original sin and also sins of intent, saying, no, we have not. Perhaps it's sort of like when we were children, we were taught the Ten Commandments and it's, we understand them as we read them. And as we grow in our faith and grow in our understanding and, and um, discussion about the Bible and the word, that we learn more of the um, subtleties of it, more of the depth of, of the meanings. Hmm. So would you say that Bildad has a... Uh, is a childlike faith then? Maybe not so much childlike, but certainly basic, maybe. Okay. So as he sees it, he reads, it, or as he reads it, that's how he sees it and understands it. Mm. He doesn't go to the same depth as what we're doing now. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's a fair, fair thing to say about the bed. Because as you said before, if we were looking at this with the full extent of the law and Bildad saying, if you're pure and upright, then God will rouse himself on your behalf. Well, then what, what hope do we ever have? Because we're always going to be sinners. Mm -hmm. I think it, it also kind of shows there's, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, this, this is works theology. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's still present today like mm -hmm. um, you have to do something it's not totally from God mm -hmm. um, yeah because essentially you can divide the entirety of the world's religions into religion of works versus religion of grace where religion of grace is you get that which you do not deserve versus a religion of works where you get what you deserve. The only true religion of grace is Christianity. But even in Christianity, it's a little bit. Oh well, yeah, you get groups. <laughs> I, I still maintain that for Roman Catholicism, it still leans kind of heavily towards the works angle of it. Uh, at, at least within some of the sects within Roman Catholicism, it leads 
it's leaning heavily on works, but um, well, I guess also the Orthodox too, because they don't they don't really make a big issue of justification by faith alone or anything like that. Um, but yeah, there's always a tendency to go more towards works. It's easier for our human brain to understand. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think grace is a hard thing to, to understand. Mm -hmm. What do you mean it's given to us before when we're still sinful? It's it's yeah. just hard to understand, I think. Mm -hmm. And yet that's the basis for our faith is that by grace we are saved. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there was a, was a really, really interesting video from somewhere in Missouri Synod, I want to say it was done by Concordia Publishing House, but I can't remember who did it. But it was looking at um, a number of children, elementary school age, and they're talking to them about, well, who, who's God, who, like, and, and well, what, what do you, what should happen if, for you to be perfect and stuff, I think it was. And then partway through, they just gave them a present. And they're going like, why did you give this to me? Like, because we want you to have it. It's like, but I didn't do anything for it. I'm like, no, you didn't. Because they had also just talked about, well, have you been bad and, and stuff like that? And you just kind of go, well, yeah, yeah, I've, I've done stupid things or I may have lied or called somebody a name. And then you just give them a present. And they, it's kind of mind boggling. Like, I don't deserve this thing. Why, why do I have it? <laughs> and I thought it was very well done because it's approaching it from kind of an emotional sense where like, yes, you have this. You don't deserve it whatsoever, but you have it. I think even adults have that same Difficulty understanding. Mm. If not worse, I, I, I would probably say. It is. Yeah, definitely worse. Because we are quite ingrained <laughs> within work. You work for a wage. You have to pay to get uh, things done in your house. You have to pay for all your food and your group and everything else that you use. It's all works. Kids, well, there's there's some grace with with the parents giving them food and clothing and a, a house to live in. And so, yeah, I, I would think maybe the adults are. It's harder to try and understand this. whole society is kind of based on you get rewarded for what you do mm -hmm. and people get offended if people um get rewarded when they didn't look like they should have <laughs> oh give me a second here yeah I just thought of a reference, but I'm not going to say it because that might it might be too politically charged. So, <laughs> <laughs> anywho, so uh, yeah, we were so Bildad is looking at basically an understanding of grace as not necessarily you work to get this grace but you work in order to get a proper character and then you receive grace. It's like grace was conditional. Yeah. Was grace something that was really emphasized in the Old Testament? I never really heard it until the New Testament. So it was there, but wasn't emphasized. The concept of grace was definitely there. Yeah. The, 
word not so much kind of, kind of like savior savior yeah. is a very new testament word retroactively people have kind of translated certain words in the old testament as savior but uh usually the better translation for the old testament is redeemer and that's kind of going between kind of the hebrew nuance to the greek nuance because the more we understand the bible we know that jesus is there right from the beginning right from creation but when you're a newcomer to to faith jesus is seen as something that's in the new testament and with the, Jesus comes the grace. So mm. it's not as visible. Well, no. Talking about Marcionism. <laughs> um, yeah, within the maybe maybe we will we'll rephrase this a little bit. Uh, between grace to to say the gospel. Uh is there a gospel in the Old Testament? Yes, it talks yeah. about life. And Genesis. All over the place. <laughs> yeah, so we don't necessarily use the word uh, grace all the time, but we do see the grace fulfilled in the gospel all over the place. Um, Even Sarah and, and Abram having a child at the age that they did, that was grace. Oh, yeah. And... Yeah, to try and also get into some of the extra words being used to describe these things. When Paul talks about that specific thing, and he does that uh, chiefly in Romans and Galatians, if you ever want to check my math. Uh, he's talking about this as that which is a promise. So Isaac is not necessarily a child of grace, but a child of the promise. Okay. And that's also how grace is described in the New Testament is this is the promise, uh, which is, I guess, a little bit more easy for Hebrews to understand because you find promises all over the place in the Old Testament. A pastor, he wasn't <clears throat> just only a child of promise, isn't he kind of like a miracle? Yeah, that, that's the same thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, all these things are kind of within the same uh, umbrella of meaning. It's you have the, more. Like the miracles, uh, well, maybe maybe not so much miracles, because usually those are described as signs, but um, how, we're, how we're using the word miracle, yes. So miracles, promises, grace, gospel, uh, all over the it's place, good. Old Testament and New. And the covenant that was between God and his people. Depending on how you want to approach that one. <laughs> Sometimes promises came out of covenants. Yes. Like, like the covenant between God and his people after the flood was the, the promise was the rainbow that he wouldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the wording, though, I would have to take like a long time to try and talk about all the nuance. But yes, covenants um, usually entail promises. Yeah. Because um, covenant specifically is a kind of a legal agreement. So it is law. But when God cuts a covenant with you and it is completely one-sided on him fulfilling it, is it is it necessarily law at that point? Or can you still... You, can you still describe it as a legal thing? And yeah, well, because because of that covenant, he shows his love. Mm -hmm. So it's complex. It is. We kind of got off a topic here, didn't we? Yeah, I think that's par for the course. But I think it, it was also fairly helpful to try and describe well what's Bill that trying to get at. And is he, say, like with the covenant and how we were just describing it, um, it is, it is a legal thing where God is saying that this this is the agreement by which we will act according to each other. But if it is a covenant that God lovingly puts in place, 
so that the cutting of the covenant is basically out of nowhere. So God gives you this promise out of nowhere, and he does it without any obligation on your part. Uh, yes, you can try and view a covenant in a very legalistic framework, which, say, the Pharisees were more inclined towards doing. But does that mean that it must be a legalism? But isn't your repentance your part of the covenant? Your I confession of faith, is that not your part of the covenant? I wouldn't necessarily say that it is. Okay. Well, uh, it depends on, on, on how we're using the word covenant in this sense, because it is and it isn't. Um, insofar as we're looking upon this from a grace aspect, then it isn't because God has first called you to faith, yeah. given you grace, so that from the outworking of faith and grace given to you, you repent of your sins and call upon your Lord. Uh, confessing. But if we're looking at this um, from another angle, then if you are recipient of grace and you are not repentant of your sins, then you are actively working against God's grace, God's gifts given to you so that even though uh, the covenant is a legal legal type of thing in that instance. You're not fulfilling it kind of disbars you from the covenant. And this was more or less what um, James was talking about when um, James chapter two, when he says faith without works is dead. If you have received God's grace given to you, then it should be working out within your life. And, and, and we see the fruits of this faith in repentance, among other things. It's sort of like um, Jesus' parable of, of the, the talents, mm. that when you just bury that grace, when you just hide it away and, and, mm. and hold on to it and keep it and don't share it, it doesn't grow. It's yeah. not what we were intended to do. We we're intended to witness that faith. Yeah. And one of the interesting little caveats like towards the end of that, when the owner comes back and he, and he wants like his interest, mm -hmm. um, he says, well, if I gave this to the bankers, I could have received it with interest. Like it would be a little, little bit of interest, but not much. He's like, I could have given this to the bankers, like a secular organization that does not care about grace. I could have given it to them and they would have still give me a return. And kind of what, Jesus is getting at with that little caveat right there is well even if you give something substantial to those who are understanding things within a works righteousness theology type of deal they would still try to be gaining something so if you're willingly withholding everything that you have received all your gifts that are given to you by God How, how can you say that you are of faith if somebody who is without faith will be doing even better than you? Yeah. So. Hard law, hard, hard law in some of those parables. <laughs> yes. But yes, uh, repentance is not necessarily uh, do this and you receive grace. It is grace has been given to you so that you can be in this and you receive grace continuously because you are still in that covenant. So it's not, it's not necessarily, um, yeah, it's there's two aspects, so, two aspects. Two aspects. Yeah. No, the grace describes the relationship. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a while ago when we were kind of going law, the law gospel relationship in the in the Sunday Bible study, yeah, we were talking a little bit about that and uh, kind of what the relationship was. Yeah, so, it, oh yeah, I remember what I was going to make out of that point. So uh, we would say that, yes, 
works are necessary, but they're not necessary for salvation. Salvation and grace come to us first, and then necessarily they must flow out of this. Um, Pastor, mm -hmm. a good example, I think of that is the thief on the cross. I just think in the same thing. Mm. Yeah, he um, confessed, you know, that he was a sinner and he looked, he believed Jesus was God. Mm -hmm. And he didn't get down from the cross and do something. <laughs> right, yep. first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thief on the cross is an interesting one because essentially as he, he only received the word about Jesus because he saw this right. guy being crucified. Yeah. He knew who he was. And then he's basically saying, yeah, I'm not worthy of anything. Please yeah. remember me though. Yeah. So you can okay. see the faith working through him like towards confession of Jesus as king, rightful king of the kingdom of God, as well as uh, repentance where he's confessing that he is a sinner. But he's not necessarily doing this as a, a condition that, oh, I, I must do this in order to be saved. But it is part of your salvation that you were doing this. So because, he, he's, because he first yeah. heard the word and received received uh, 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 the Holy Spirit through the word of God, then he's working this out. Yeah. Didn't he rebuke the other thief? Yep. You know, saying that uh, this man did not deserve, but we both deserve, deserve what we're getting. Yep. Right? In a way, he was a witness. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know, I really think that's a very comforting thing because, um, you know, there's a the parable in the Bible about the vineyard. Of the, they're hiring people out during the day, some people working all day, and, and then but they're all getting the same wage. And the people that had worked all day were really upset about the people that worked for one hour and got paid the same. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's the way it is about our um, reward of that heaven. Some people might live a sinful life most of their life, and then near the end of their life, come to faith, mm. and they get the same reward of someone who's been, you know, circumspect their whole life. Mm. And some people find that offensive, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Oh, yeah. Our human nature. Yeah. And and given the nature of the parable, Jesus is specifically talking about the people in the pews. Like, oh, yeah, you're probably going to, some of you will be offended by this. Yes. <laughs> people who have been with me for years. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's kind yeah. of a paradox, isn't it? It is sort of like your your recent servants. Yes. <laughs> All right. I'll take your word on that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, working it back a little bit. So, yeah, we were we were kind of exploring, and I think this was a helpful exploration of kind of the, some of the difficulties with understanding this type of thing, which is not easy necessarily to grasp and we find many different figures throughout scripture confused if not getting it outright wrong what's going on and, and Bildad seems to be one of those who are, cannot balance law and gospel and decides to only look at the law so he's saying uh, you know God will restore the upright and pure because that is what God has called to do so this is how Bildad understands theology uh, God rewards the faithful, the good. God punishes the evil, the wicked. So if you're upright and pure, then you will be restored. So he inadvertently admits the righteous can suffer, though. Uh, so he does admit that there can be some suffering involved in the life of 
the righteous person. Otherwise, how can they re be restored? Restored from what? Right. So it's not like the friends are completely out to lunch whenever they're making their points, saying, but they think that, uh, say, the hedge that is around Job, the, the hedge only appears a couple times in, throughout the book of Job, but the hedge at the very beginning that Satan was mocking, like, said to God, well, have you not put a hedge around Job that you protect everything that he has? Um, even in affliction, people assume that the hedge is still there so that, well, God has not left, allowed you to experience the most horrible of all horrible things. There's still something left for you to suffer. So uh, the righteous people, they may suffer, but they won't suffer completely. Uh, which is kind of an odd thing to assume when you're coming up in a situation like Job. But uh, still, Job recognizes that the hedge of protection is there, except he's viewing it from inside out. Um, I talked about this when we were talking about chapter three, but I won't go into it. So uh, the other aspect is, um, can what is what Bildad saying applicable to Job? Well, Job is upright by divine admission, so God himself says that this is the case. But Job has not been restored yet. So Bildad has to make a couple of assumptions. So either Job is upright and pure, which Bildad is hoping at this point in time. So either so Job is upright and pure, but has not yet pleaded with God, which is kind of an odd thing to kind of assume because Job was just talking in prayer to God. He wasn't quite pleading to be restored per se, but you, he was grappling with God in holy conversation. And then uh, Bildad's other assumption would have to be that if Job is not restored, then he must be sinful. So either Job has not pleaded yet with God or he is sinful. Um, Pastor, was he thinking that Job had a sin he hadn't repented of? Was that what he meant by sinful? Well, he hasn't voiced this yet. This, this is kind of the underlying assumptions of his speech. So he's going to actually voice this in his next speech in oh, shoot, this is, chapter 18, I believe it is. Yes, chapter 18. Chapter 18, Bildad, when he speaks again, he's going to start accusing Job of sin. But for now, he's still trying to give Job a little bit of a benefit of the doubt. Um, I just want to say, unfortunately, I'm going to have to uh, leave this uh, Bible study in six minutes because I have oh. another business thing that I have to do. Okay. About six more minutes. Six more minutes. <laughs> That may give us enough time to complete this section. Okay, so, <laughs> so this, so the Roman numeral four here. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Roman numeral four here. Uh, it, these are kind of my speculations about what Bildad is missing. So missing from Bildad's claims is how a person becomes upright and pure. So Bildad is assuming that one who is upright and pure will be restored automatically through prayer and, and pleading with God. So how does one become pure and upright? And he doesn't really talk about this. And it's made all the more curious in his third and last speech in the book, which is in uh, chapter 24, sorry, 25 there, where Bildad claims no person is righteous or pure from birth at all. So he's looking at this in terms of, say, original sin, where yeah, somebody is born into sinfulness. But if you're born into sinfulness, well, then how do you become pure and upright? It has to, there has to be something that goes along later in life to actually make that happen. Well, uh, Bildad does not provide an explanation besides essentially possessing hope in God. He does this uh, a little bit later in in this one speech. Um, although Eliphaz 
the the other friend, the friend that spoke first, he does say that well, if if you're doing good works, then you must be good. So even if you're born to trouble, if you're born in sinfulness, if you start doing good works, well, then that must mean that you're pure and upright, right? Um, which is also a very unbib unbiblical position to have, but uh, that might be actually what Eliphaz is assuming. But uh, Zophar actually gets a little bit closer in this. Oh, and I didn't give a scripture reference on that. But Zophar, the third friend who has not yet spoken, he's assuming that, well, God will forget some of your sin. So if you try to combine all the friends here, if, if, if we're assuming that they're coming from the same position, you were born sinful, you start doing as many good works as you can and try to be faithful, and then God will forget your sin once you are pure and upright. So basically you do good works so that God will not judge you according to your sins, but according to the new and better works. And if so, congratulations, this is Islam. <laughs> More or less. Um, I, I don't think they have quite a robust view of original sin as we do, but yeah. I don't think they gave him too much comfort. No. Yeah, as we were mentioning in some of the previous Bible studies on this, if if you're looking completely towards our our works, and even our character, or our, even our past pros prosperity, that's not exactly helpful. Those things can be slightly comforting that there has been good in our lives, but if we're looking to a source of salvation, those things are now gone. If we're in suffering now, then those things have not resulted in something without suffering. You're suffering in this life now. Those things happened in the past. So if there's any causal effect on the present, then they have not helped you with your suffering problem. So in order to be delivered from suffering at the present time or even in the past time or even in the future time, you need someone who is, you need someone or something to draw you out of it. So good works have not saved you because you're in, you're in suffering now. Uh, God forgetting your sin. Uh, well, no, I won't, I won't comment about that. But yes, uh, if we're looking towards our works, looking towards our character, well, they have not saved you, saved Job at this point in time. He's still suffering. So what hope does he have? I'm going to oh. have to say goodbye now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bye, Laura. And thank Bye, you, Laura. Pastor. Bye, Laura. I'll David. catch the rest on uh, YouTube. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye, David. So, uh, so where, where can you look for your salvation? So Job will actually, his hope is actually in forgiveness. He mentioned this just previously in his speech, uh, verse 21, where he's talking about, why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? So he's wondering, well, if I'm, if I'm suffering now, is this because of my sinfulness? So why have you not forgiven my sins or pardoned my offenses? And if we're actually looking at the life of Job, well, his sins have been forgiven and his offenses pardoned. And that happened way back with animal sacrifices because Job was regularly in these practices. And if you want to point to where God has forgiven you your sins, for, for us as Christians, we point towards the word in the sacraments because these are very concrete things given to us to say you are forgiven in Christ. 
Um, likewise, a, a person who is troubled over their sin, who feels like it is weighing heavily upon their soul, maybe it's affecting them now, um, you can confess that sin to a pastor, and then the pastor can absolve you of that sin. And because of your confession, um, and the absolution especially, you know you have now you now have a date and a time and a place where you are forgiven that sin. You can always look back at that historical event and go, "Yep, I'm forgiven." Same thing with baptism. You, you point to baptism and say, "Yep, date, time, place, witnesses, all of that points to me being forgiven of my baptism right then and there." I think Job is is looking to grace for his forgiveness but he's a little bit confused just like the friends because he's he's looking for proof of that forgiveness in what he has and because he hasn't got anything he's thinking he hasn't been forgiven there's definitely some confusion about that yeah So maybe he's, maybe there's not quite as big a gulf between their thinking or his thinking and his friend's thinking. There is, but we'd have to get to his next speech to see what, what it is. <laughs> no, I was just thinking of the, 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 the verse 21, you quote, why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? Well, he's we know his sins have been forgiven. And the fact that he's asking that question seems to relate to the fact that so much has been taken away from him. Yeah. And a lot of that has to deal with, well, uh, the phrasing of the translation too. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm sorry that I, I'm doing this once again, because, um, yeah, for, for Job, what I really like to do is I like to study the original text as much as I can with basically my novice understanding of, of Hebrew. But uh, with Job especially as one of the most difficult books to translate, actually it is the most difficult book in scripture to translate. Um, you could also translate this as kind of are my sins forgiven are my pardons so are my offenses pardoned oh, okay is or or is this the case um and, and i'm basing that on the previous verse verse 20 where he's giving the hypothetical situation kind of, if i have sinned what have i done to him and like um and like, why have you made me your target? So why have I experienced these sufferings? Hypothetically, if I had sinned, this would make sense. So hypothetically, uh, have you pardoned my sins? Have you, yeah, have you, have you forgiven my sins? So I think it must, oh, sorry. sorry. I just was sort of thinking that in the Old Testament, people of God would, would make sacrifices, which um, Job had done, but there was a long distance between when he'd made the sacrifice and now that they're talking. Whereas we know that Christ made the sacrifice for us and we receive it through the sacraments of mm -hmm. communion. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very real today, on at the moment forgiveness mm -hmm. whereas job experienced that forgiveness with the sacrifice with the sacrifice of of burnt offering a few months ago now so maybe that's why he's questioning it if if he was in the in the correct habit of making burnt offerings on a regular space of time 
I don't know how often, but on a regular basis. And he hasn't been able to do that for quite a distance. Maybe he's thinking, well, I haven't, I haven't made a sacrifice to you. Therefore, maybe my my period of atonement is, is not there anymore. Okay. okay. To give you a very real and recent example, um, many people in the congregation have, like in Hope Lutheran Church, have not mm -hmm. received the sacrament of Holy Communion for a period of months. Yes. Would you say that forgiveness has left them? No. Yeah, and it's the same for Joe. So that the attitude they had back then too, was it even if they weren't able to, to make those sacrifices, they knew they were still forgiven? That yeah. seems to be what he's questioning. Yeah, and that was um, kind of what we were touching upon, uh, I think it was two, three Bible studies ago. I can't remember. But when we were looking at Psalm 51, and David was in that psalm was saying, like, you do not delight in sacrifices or I would give them. A sac okay. perfect sacrifice to you is a broken and contrite heart. So the person who is broken by God's law, confessing their sinfulness to him, they will be forgiven. There is that understanding. The outworking of this assurance goes into the animal sacrifices, which are done in accordance to essentially your station in life. So if you could afford it, you would afford a larger animal, or if you couldn't afford it, you would... And this is kind of going into Mo the law of Moses, not, not necessarily specifically for Job, but um, in the law of Moses, you could actually pair with multiple households in order to afford a certain animal for the forgiveness of sins if you could not afford it on your own. Okay. So God's law is trying to make these types of things accessible to even the poorest among the community. So Job is not hard and fast removed from God's salvation because he can no longer afford a sacrifice. Um, certainly if he was weaker in faith, I, I don't really like to use that term, but uh, if, if he was less assured of his faith or less knowledgeable about God, maybe, maybe if, if, if he was a new convert or something, uh, he might think that the sacrifice was the be, on, be all and end all in the forgiveness. And this is kind of what Bildad is pointing to, like if you're perfect and upright and then you're, you will be restored. Um, so if you afford an animal, then you will be forgiven, but until then you're not forgiven type of thing. Um, then Job might, might be worried about that specifically, but here, I don't think so. Um, Job definitely has a, a better understanding of of God than Bildad does. Yeah. Because and if you look in uh, verse twenty when he says, "Why have you made me your target?" Uh, he's talking specifically about the afflictions that he has received, and this is these began when he was still offering the sacrifices and he's saying that they're continuing today because because of his bad dreams and insomnia um, and, and persistence of his skin disease but he's not necessarily counting that i'm suffering because my sins committed after the ability to to make the sacrifice okay um, yeah Essentially, yeah, we'll probably butt up against this type of thing again, uh, going into chapter 14. Job has a speech there where he's kind of giving a hypothetical situation where 
if God hides him in Sheol and then bring calls him out, so sort of the idea of a resurrection, then God would hide his hide Job's sins and never let them out. Uh, so Job is recognizing that uh, this is not solely done through animal sacrifices, but according to God's good and gracious will. But Job is just kind of racked around trying to think, well, how does this actually work out in practice? Because he has, he has the theory that, yeah, God forgives those who are faithful to him, but he doesn't necessarily know how this works out in practice, especially when we get into some of the weird conundrums, like with Job being a righteous man who has suffered great evil. But um, uh, as opposed to, say, the friends looking towards um, reliance on works, like in the case of Eliphaz, or character in the face of Bildad, or even so far, kind of God being not necessarily arbitrary, but sort of in that type of vein where God is allowing certain sins to be forgotten once you are far enough away from the sort of a statute of limitations type of deal. Job is looking at very concrete things like animal sacrifices and God's active and deliberate forgiveness in his life. Um, looking to God for the source of these things rather necessarily to himself, which friends tend to do. Not so much so far, but we'll get to so far in, in, in a while. Oh yeah, and that's what I put here. So the friends appear to rely on their efforts or God's arbitrariness for salvation while Job relies on grace. Therein lies the difference. Yep. Any other thoughts about this little section here? If not, we'll move on to the next little bit, which might be re very, very long. I don't know. <laughs> Depends on how deep you want to go into this one. So uh, verses 8 to 10. Would anybody like to read? Ask the former generations and find out what their fathers learned. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. Will you not instruct? Will they not instruct you and tell you? Will they not bring forth words from their understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is really short, but it really gives you a kind of an eye, a good glimpse of what. Bildad's theology is really built on. So he's appealing to former generations to corroborate uh, his current theology. Yeah, I phrased that maybe a bit too academically there. So um, basically, he's saying that the past generations will, oops, past generations will agree with him that if you do good, God will bless you. If you do evil, God will punish you. So in this sense, we can call Bildad a uh, traditionalist. So his one of the primary driving forces of his theology is what the previous generations have taught. So insofar as Eliphaz was looking at experiences like his dreams, uh, your works, and reliance on those things for confirmation of your salvation or uh, God's assurance of of things to you, Bildad will now be looking at former generations and the interplay of history, which, yeah, 
it's not terribly out there because that's what a lot of the Old Testament is about, is about looking at all these historical narratives and understanding theology through them. Um, even Jesus, when he was talking about a few different things, he would appeal to Jonah or King David or even uh, the life of Moses. And these things were always there to kind of draw from. Um, uh, the new... The letters in the New Testament, uh, Paul makes a lot of references to, say, the Red Sea, the like the Red Sea parting that was connected to baptism, uh, eating man in the desert that's connected with the Lord's Supper. Uh, oh, uh, Ishmael, so Abraham, who had a child, Ishmael, by the slave woman Hagar, versus uh, the child Isaac bought you know, the free woman Sarah and, and juxtaposing those two. Paul makes reference to that as well. So history is very important to theology, especially when this history is directed by God. So it's not that so Bill Dead isn't wrong in trying to find the source in theology. It's what he how he interprets the source of theology that is difficult. Um, one of the logical fallacies, if you didn't, if you didn't catch it, is he's saying that you should not look to this contemporary generation as a source of theology, because uh, he phrased it in verse nine: "We were born only yesterday and know nothing; our days on earth are but a shadow." So he's saying, yeah, we only live for a very short time, so therefore we shouldn't rely solely on our knowledge. We should look to all the former generations. Yeah, but do people live a lot longer in the past? Because <laughs> um, if he's saying that, well, if everybody who in this current generation is very short-lived and they cannot contribute much to collective theological wisdom, then isn't that true of just about every single generation? Except for possibly the patriarchs in the in the book of Genesis who lived for hundreds of years, but still it doesn't make any sense to really say, oh well, because you were older, like you lived in a previous generation, therefore you knew more than we do now. Which tends to be not the direction of scientific discovery. Just saying. I think it's something we run up against currently too, you know, but that's the way we've always done it. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, it, like in verse um, eight, it says, ask your, the former generations. It's because we have the benefit of being able to to read all the books of the Bible, mm -hmm. and there's there's was an oral history, so their oral history only came up to Job. I mean, it may have been more intimate because they were in in a much different physical relationship with God and His creation. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that too. So we're, we're actually going to be looking at some of these narratives ourselves. It's just that if you're saying by default these people must have more knowledge, is that true for every single generation? And I'll say, no, it's, it's not true for every single generation. Is it possible? Oh, yeah, sure. Should have, been, should have been true for, say, Adam and Eve, like the first generation who were able to walk in the garden with God. But if we're looking to something as concrete as that, then we should probably just explore what on earth actually happened <laughs> and see if that corroborates, uh, uh, corroborates Bildad's claim. I'm, I'm looking for a specific quote from Yaroslav Pelikan. Ah, here we go. 
Uh, Yaroslav Pelikan, probably not a very familiar name, but he was in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in the States. And he was a theologian and historian and a scholar. Uh, I really like his one quote where he said, uh, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. <laughs> so kind of what Linda was saying, like, that's the way we've always done it. <laughs> like, yeah, but why are you doing it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the difference. Uh, so for us, tradition is a big part of our worship. I mean, like, I, I wear something that's relatively unorthodox. Like, I can't really go out in an all but with a stole in the street without drawing a few eyes. But it, that's something that we use to try, because that's the tradition that we have built up, and it is rather useful for us in, in different ways. So as, as long as we're actively drawing out what was in the past to help us in the present, then that is good tradition. Yeah. But if we're just imposing these things on us for not necessarily a good reason, then yeah, that's kind of, that's the second half of the quote. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. I think by, by physically wearing the stoles, it's, it's a declaration that you are the preacher, you are the teacher, that that is your um, office. I think if Pastor Coltman, or no, it wasn't Pastor Coltman, it, it was uh, Michael Kobach, which he came to be our pastor for mm -hmm. three or four months. He had come from Papua New Guinea, so he claimed that he could not use his stoles because they were in storage. Mm. So I asked you why he didn't wear his stoles. It kind of, right? Mm. And he would have said, I was a traditionalist with dead faith because he's not ever put them on. Mm. He left and he, he was saying basically what he proclaims in the message has nothing to do with the souls or how he's dressed. And he wanted me to focus on the words and not the garments. Hmm. And I later met him, he, he took a call to Soyuz, I think. And I met him at a convention and I said, well, have you unpacked your stoles yet? And he said, oh yeah, they've been unpacked for a long time, but he doesn't use them. Hmm. Unless he's in a situation where it, he feels, um, it would be warranted or, or um, um, it may raise eyebrows if he didn't. So if it was doing an or, um, it was part of a, um, someone's ordination or something like that, I think he would, he would wear them, but on a regular Sunday, he does not. Okay. So he would say the same thing. I was a traditionalist with dead faith. Mm -hmm. But for many of us who have grown up with these traditions, um, we appreciate them. They enhance the word, I think, I somewhat. Um, I was talking to you about the service last Sunday. I was distracted by the, the camera. Mm. So I ended up turning it off and just hearing the words. Mm. Right, so, um, yeah. But you said even one time to me that when you closed your eyes, then you could focus on the word and not be distracted by anything else yeah and i, I often do that during when i'm there physically in in person mm -hmm. i will close my eyes because i get distracted by the the speaker i want to hear the voice of god and sometimes i i can't do that or there have been times in my life where the the person physically um delivering those words i get focused i get constant i get distracted by the fact that that is that is that particular person saying it and not God saying it. So I just close my eyes. I think that's okay. That's how you hear best. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, we, we never really want our, 
worship of God to be dependent on these types of things. Yeah. But we can always use them to, well, in the practice of our worship services. Like, they should not be governed by these things, but they can be helpful and useful to us and bring us right into the service. Uh, kind of, kind of the same thing with, uh, say, the candles, like um, mm -hmm. or the flowers, or or the flower, flowers too. Yes, yeah, because yeah, the flowers are representative of life and God's creation. Uh, the candles are representative of the light of Christ among us. Mm -hmm. And they're very useful to have in the service to try and create an atmosphere of worship. Are they absolutely necessary for worship? No, no. but they're useful. They sometimes help create a focus. I mean, even stained glass windows are all the word, the word in pictures. Mm. Yeah. Well, even stained, stained glass now has become more of a, a tradition than it has a particular teaching tool, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, because most people are literate now, so they can look at these things. And then we're, we're and also with literacy comes a lot more uh, printing options. So you can also get a lot of picture books, which are tailored to the young ages who might not be able to read or read as well. So stained glass isn't as necessary as it used to be back when a lot of people were illiterate and they needed pictures to help illustrate the gospel, but they're still very beautiful and we like to have them. And they reflect the um, catechism on one side and the life of Christ on the other at our church. Mm -hmm. So they're very specific. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think all these things, some for some people it's distraction, for some people it's an enhancement. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Yeah. I was thinking that we, I could take this off in attention, but we're already close to time, so I won't. Okay. Um, yeah, so for next time we meet, we're going to be actually looking kind of a bird's eye view on some of the things that Bildad is claiming. So uh, we'll be looking at some of the Old Testament stories to see if they actually reflect build add specific claims in how they play out. Um, so this is why I'm saying that, I was saying that this could be potentially very long, this little section of three verses, because you can talk about Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and Abraham, a lot of Abraham. Uh, and we'll start getting into that next time. Um, any, any other thoughts or? Questions, comments to be made here? I think the friends sort of seem to bring up different as aspects of faith, mm. representative of different aspects of faith as they talk to Job. Yep. Yep, that's uh, Eliphaz with the experiential parts and then Bildad with the traditional. And then Zophar will be the rationalist. As close to as the rationalist as you'll get in Old Testament times. Yeah. All right. Um, I was trying to think of a Pertinent psalm. Well, let's go with Psalm one. Make it simple.
Let us pray. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We know this, O Lord, and we thank and praise you for working this out among us, that we might stand in your word and be found in your gospel truth. We pray, O Lord, that when things do not work out quite this way, when uh, members of your, of your congregations, they are subject to suffering like Job was, or even in minor instances like Job was, that you do not point them to the law, a division between uh, the wicked who are blown away while the righteous prosper, that they judge all things in this way, that they declare themselves wicked and apart from you, but that you strengthen us when we fall into hardship and encourage us by your forgiveness and your grace that we stand in you all the days of our life. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.